Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 1415, Part 2. So we're going to start looking at the cranial nerves. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do here is is start really just drawing them out. Uh, Tom out, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve cranial nerves nerves okay we're going to draw them out and what i mean by drawing them out we're going to draw a little mnemonic that will help you guys learn them so number one we're going to draw a one the number one okay and you're going to see what this is going to make up a person like a face and, and person and that is the olfactory okay number two we're going to draw eyes that's the optic. So we made the nose in one, number number two. Number three, we're going to take that and lay it on its side. That is the oculomotor nerve. Number four, we're going to go up here into the upper part of the eye because it moves the eye. It's an eye movement. And that is the trochlear. Number five, we're going to come like this. like that and that is the trigeminal number six eye movement that is the abducens or abducent number seven I'm sorry I can make that a little straighter Okay, facial. Number eight, let's make some ears. That is vestibulocochlear. Vestibulocochlear, can't really write that very well with this pen. It's uh, running in a little room there. It, I don't like this little board very much, but this is how I do my online videos for my classes. All right, number nine, glossopharyngeal. Number 10, vagus. Number 11, accessory. And number 12, hypoglossal to remember them remember the nom uh, the mnemonic obviously once one takes the anatomy final very good vodka alleviates headaches okay uh another one that we use sometimes is o o o to touch and feel very gooey viscera ah so, um, if you were working with your cadaver, okay? So, uh, this little guy here really can help you a lot in getting the numbers down, okay? All right. So, uh, let's talk about them a little bit. Let's get into what they do. Uh, we have, uh, uh, number one, the olfactory does sense of smell. Number two, the optic does sense of vision or sight. Uh, number three, the oculomotor, that does the eye movement. Uh, number four, trochlear, does eye movement. Number five is sensory motor to face. Um, uh, that's trigeminal. Uh, number six, your um, uh, your abducens. It's going to be more eye movement. Uh, number seven, the facial. That's going to be both sensory motor to face, like facial expressions, for example. Number eight, vestibulocochlear. That's hearing and balance. Number nine, glossopharyngeal, sensory motor to your head and neck, dealing like with the throat and tongue. Uh, Ten, vagus, the uh, visceral motor, both. Um, uh, thorax and abdomen. Uh, the uh, um, the ex uh, number eleven. The accessory is motor for the neck and upper back, and twelve is hypoglossal for tongue. It's motor. Now to remember their sensory motor or both. Uh, here's what I tell my students: is some say "Mary, money," but my brother says "Big brains matter more." Okay. 
So uh, it's kind of a good way to remember them uh, when you have to go through them, okay? So here they are in anatomical uh, drawings. I hope you guys kind of see the cranial nerves where they are. Um, cranial nerves there. Uh, in in lecture, I in lab, I also use Harry Potter in the cranial nerves. I use uh, the uh, mnemonic... Um, on, 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 they traveled and found Voldemort guarding very ancient Horcruxes. Uh, so there's Harry Potter and the, and the uh, cranial nerves. Um, so, all right. Some say merry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. Sensory motor or both sensory and motor, okay? All right. Now let's talk a little bit about since that part's kind of easy. It really is something I spend some time on, but it doesn't take us too long to get those. But this part, it can take us a little bit of time, is understand this idea of transduction. What is transduction? What is a receptor? Receptors are transducers. What does it mean to be a transducer? What does transduction mean? There's a really fascinating thing that sensory receptors have the ability to do, and that is to turn physical stimuli, things that are happening like touch, like sound waves, like photons, some physical thing into something the brain can understand. Okay, the, the goal here is to transduce, is to turn a stimulus into something the brain can understand, into an action potential, into sensations to be detected into an action potential. So transduction is the conversion of a stimulus to an electrical impulse the brain can understand. Basically, receptors are very good at detecting what they detect, but they don't detect other things. A photoreceptor detects photons, does not detect sound waves. A balance receptor used in the inner ear detects head and neck movement, does not detect sound. They are very good at the thing they detect and not other things. The thing they detect is called a modality. That is the sensation that is detected. Like, for example, a pain receptor's modality is pain. A touch receptor's modality is touch. A vibration receptor, vibration, pressure, receptor, pressure. Those are modalities. Those are the sensations detected by a particular receptor. is called a modality. Now, one of the ways that I like to say this is, is for one receptor, there's one modality and there's one neuron. Okay. One receptor, one neuron, one modality. Okay. That's a really good way of thinking about this, okay? When a sense receptor is activated, it sends information to a bundle of neurons. So there's one receptor and there is only one neuron for that kind of receptor. So for example, if I have a sense receptor, a single bundle of neurons, okay, that I have, that I've got, my neurons, okay, that neuron can only have one kind of receptor on it. It's basically the way we can say this. Is one way to say it is that one neuron can only have one kind of receptor. If, uh, a neuron can have many receptors, but they all must be the same kind of receptor. Okay, that's called the label line principle. That's what we call that. Okay, basically, kind of imagine that I. My axon and my neuron is a line that I can label and say that information is only pain. That information is only touch. That information is only vibration. That information is only proprioception. That's all that is carrying is that one modality, one receptor, one modality, one neuron. Okay? All right. Now let's get into these receptors a little bit more, and we can classify them based on how they respond. We have what's called tonic versus phasic. Now tonic receptors, these are always active. These increase or decrease frequency of action potentials, and that directly reflects, that's just a reflex, an increase or decrease in the stimuli. So uh, that should say reflex, not re-elex. I, I apologize for the typo. I catch typos in my notes. I'm, it's, I'm one person. I teach a lot of classes. I'm going to have typos. Um, phasic receptors, they're usually not active. They provide information about intensity and rate of, uh, and rate of change. They are bursts of action potentials, and they end when the stimulus stops and, or it doesn't change in intensity. Okay, so what we can basically say is tonic receptors, they increase or decrease, uh, and that's directly response to how 
intense a stimulus is. Okay. Now, receptors can adapt. They can be they can reduce their sensitivity to a stimulus. There's fast adapting. Okay. This is also called a phasic receptor. Phasic receptors are fast adapting. These guys uh, they respond very strongly at first, but their activity skins to decrease, like temperature changes. You will really note a temperature change right off the bat. Like a great example is it's in the summer here, it gets in the high 90s Fahrenheit. So warm and humid. I leave the house. The house is well air conditioned. I walk out into high 90s and humid, and it's like that heat slaps me in the face. Okay. Well, that's, and then after a while, I'm like, okay, I'm used to it. I'm used to this heat now. That is fast adapting. Okay. Slow adapting called tonic receptors, they show little adaptation. Like pain can occur for a long time after the damage has ever occurred. Okay. So it's a, uh, it's a thing that can happen. So. All right. Now, let's talk about receptors based on what they carry. Exterior receptors monitor any external body conditions. These are your special taste, special senses, not special taste, but special senses. Things like vision, taste, hearing, smell, equilibrium, things like that. Interior receptors, they do internal conditions. These are nociceptors, pain receptors, thermoceptors, temperature receptors, mechanoceptors, they have mechanically gated ion channels. Tactile receptors, touch receptors, bare receptors, pressure stretch receptors, and proprioceptors, body position receptors, okay? Now, thermoceptors, they do extreme changes. So they're going to be basically free nerve endings. They're in the dermis, like when your skin feels hot stuff. They're in your skeletal muscle to feel the warmth of the muscle. They're in your liver and your hypothalamus. So they're in some important parts of the brain. There are four times as many cold receptors as there are warm receptors. And temperature can travel on the same pathways as pain. That's why we can perceive Temp, uh, strong temperatures is very painful, like really cold is painful, really hot is painful. Uh, these receptors are very active when the temperature changes, but they adapt so you get used to it. This is why your bathtub can start to not feel as warm as it was when you first got in it. Mechanoceptors, they detect stimuli that distort the shape of the cell membrane. When the cell membrane changes shape, the sodium channels open or close with distortion of cell membrane, and that can help to depolarize the cell. Uh, they use glutamate and substance P. Remember, substance P is used in pain receptors. So uh, some of these can actually have some painful kind of perceptions as well, especially bare receptors. Pressure can be a little painful sometimes. Um, they use substance P or glutamate. One of the things that we're going to see is a bare receptor that detects uh, pressure changes in the wall, blood vessels, your urinary tract, your digestive tract, things like that, respiratory tract. Um, so proprioceptors, they detect positions of your joints and your muscles. And your tactile receptors, they do touch, pressure, and vibration. Okay. Now, for tactile receptors, these can be free nerve endings. They're between the epidermal cells, very sensitive to touch and pressure. There could be a root hair plexus. They have nerve endings around root hairs. When, that, when the root moves, hair moves, uh, it, the dendrites move, and they form extra potentials. Tactile discs, the Merkel's discs, they are very sensitive to fine touch. They have a very small receptive field. Uh, there's tactile corpuscles, sometimes called messenger's corpuscles. Uh, these provide sensation about fine touch and pressure. They're very fast acting because they're myelinated. They're in very sensitive areas like your eyelids, your lips, your fingertips, your nipples, and your genitals. Lamellated corpuscles called Pacinian corpuscles, they're very deep pressure. They're sensitive to deep pressure. They're in the dermis of fingers, mammary glands, and genitals. They are in joint capsules, pancreas, and bladder wall as well. Ruffini corpuscles detect pressure and distortion of skin. They're in the dermis. They're fused the collagen in the dermis. When the fibers move, it stimulates them. So when skin stretches. So here you can see all these different receptors. Okay. Bare receptors are mechanoceptors that do pressure. They're in the walls of hollow organs, blood vessels, lungs, digestive urinary tracts, for example. Okay. All places you might find them. 
Proprioception, this is a somatic sensation that body's position. Now, there's no proprioceptors for visceral organs. For example, I can't tell where my spleen, appendix, or pancreas is at this moment. I can't feel where it is. It can hurt. I can have pain. But I can't tell that my spleen is moved or not. It's in your joints, your tendons, and ligaments, and your muscles. There are three major groups. There's your muscle spind spindle organs we talked about in, later on, and they do the stretch reflexes. They monitor scale muscle length. There are Golgi tendon organs, and they're between the skeletal muscle and its tendon, and they monitor tension during a contraction. And then there's the joint capsule receptors, and they're free nerve endings that detect pressure and tension on the joint as well. Chemoceptors detect the release of chemicals that are released or chemicals that cells released or chemical composition of the ECF. They respond to chemicals in the surrounding fluid. They're primarily located in the brain to monitor pH and CSF and the aorta along with your carotid arteries um, uh, as well to monitor the chemicals leaving the heart, to, uh, test the blood before it leaves and goes out. These include osmoreceptors, which also are involved in concentration in your body fluids in your blood. Now, what we're going to get into next is a big thing called sensory pathways, okay? We're going to start talking about sensory pathways. And what I want to do is, guys, is talk about the um, three neurons that are involved in sensation. The first order, second order, and third order neuron. First order neuron, that's a sensory neuron. That's the neuron that comes from the, uh, from the uh, sensory receptor and goes to your CNS. Then there's an interneuron. That's the second order neuron. That's the interneuron that synapses with the first order. The third order, get, the second order comes into it, and it is used to make you aware of the information. It goes to the through the thal, uh, it comes from the thalamus uh, out to the right part of the brain. Okay, or it's delivered to the somatosensory cortex or uh, of the cerebrum. There, uh, if there is a third order neuron, third order neurons sometimes they don't exist. We'll talk about a case where there's only a first order and second order. Somewhere along the way, the second order neuron crosses over, whether it crosses over where it enters or whether it crosses over somewhere up in the brain, it crosses over. There's always going to be sensory information from the right side of the body to the left half of the brain and vice versa. Okay. So what we're going to see, guys, is um, these pathways are tracks in the spinal cord. There's a posterior column pathway. There's spinocerebellar pathways and spinothalamic pathways. Okay, we we're talking about the posterior column pathway first, and we're talking about the spinothalamic, then the spinocerebellar. Let's start with the posterior column pathway. There's two tracks that make up, two distinct tracks that make it up we'll talk about. The posterior column pathway, what does it carry? Now, here's what I want you to know about each pathway. What they carry, okay, where they cross over, where they end, and are you aware of it? Okay, every one of the pathways, that's what you need to know. What they carry, where they cross over, where they end, and are you aware of it? Okay. Now, let's talk about the first order neuron. That carries fine touch, vibration, pressure, proprioception. Second order neuron, that crosses over at the brainstem. Third order neuron extends the primary sensory cortex, so you are aware of it. Okay. Now, it's two distinctive tracks. One does the lower half of the body. That's fasculus gracilis. Gracilis is more for the part near the ground. And Cuneatus is the upper part, upper half of the body. It handles the sensory information above upper half of the body. Okay. Okay. Now, let's talk about the anterior spinothalamic. Now, why is it called spinothalamic? The second order neuron goes from the spinal cord to the thalamus. This is why. First order neuron brings information of crude touch and pressure. Second oron, order neuron crosses over at level of entry. It travels up to the thalamus, where the third order neuron goes to the primary somatosensory cortex, so you are aware of it. Okay, you're consciously aware of it. The lateral spinothalamic tract, which is part of the spinothalamic pathways, this is carrying pain and temperature. 
Pain and temperature, it crosses over at level. So we bring it in, pain and temperature, second order neuron crosses over at level of entry, goes up to the thalamus, spinal thalamic. Then uh, it is, now remember this pain and temperature that we're carrying, then it goes out to the uh, cerebral cortex right here. Okay. All right. So you are aware of it. Now this one, notice there is a first order, second order neuron, no third order. You are not aware of it consciously. Now there are two of these distinctive tracks that make up the spinocerebellar pathway. There's an anterior and posterior spinocerebellar tract. The anterior and posterior spinocerebellar tract carries proprioception and tendon stretch. They both do it. Anterior spinocerebellar tract, the anterior one crosses over at level of entry. The other one doesn't cross over. Okay. You have a first order neuron. You have a second order neuron, but no third order. Final destination is the cerebellum, so you are not aware of it. Okay. All right, that's all the ascending pathways. The ascending pathways, remember, are sensory pathways. Now, descending pathways are going to be motor pathways. We're going to talk about that. But before we do it, let's talk about referred pain. Referred pain is a phenomenon that happens, for example, because of your um, uh, dermatomes. Basically, it's a dermatomal problem, okay? There's a dermatome that carry that is monitoring a single patch of skin, a patch of skin that's monitored by a single pair of cranial or spinal nerves. And what happens is, is you get pain on the skin that you feel when in, uh, that pain is being felt on the skin, but the pain is somewhere else. Because the painful sensation is carried by similar pathways as another part of the body. Pain is elsewhere in the body, but it's perceived as it's on like your left arm. So the pain of a heart attack perceives like it's on your left arm, okay, the skin of your left arm. That's referred pain, okay? All right. Now, uh, let's talk about motor pathways. Now, motor pathways for somatic motor, there's two neurons. There's an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Now, patients may have lesions to these neurons, so do pay attention to them. There's a condition that can happen to patients who get stabbed and their spinal cord gets cut. Only halfway through, they get something called brown cigar syndrome. Uh, this can happen to hemiplegia. Uh, so we'll talk about this. The upper motor neuron, the cell body lies in the CNS, the processing center. Okay, it synapses with the lower motor neuron. The lower motor neuron comes down from the CNS. Sorry, I keep yawning. I am exhausted. And it goes out to a motor unit. And what happens is it um, it goes out to form a innervation of the muscles. So that's actually where the muscles innervated, and only lower motor neurons innervate the muscle fibers. So the uh, the upper motor neurons just inhibit or facilitate the lower motor neurons. Okay. All right. Now for motor pathways, there's going to be three major pathways, corticospinal, medial, and lateral. The basal nuclei and the cerebellum both help adjust these pathways. That's why problems with the basal nuclei, problems with the cerebellum can cause movement uh, issues and dexterity problems. Um, this is why I have really bad um, um, really bad kind of coordination is I have problems with my cerebellum. My cerebellum herniated out of my frame and magnum. Uh, the output of these function is sim uh, can actually stimulate or inhibit your motor nuclei and your primary motor cortex. So it can help adjust. Um, uh, uh, we can use our motor nuclei and our primary motor cortex to adjust everything. Okay. So those adjust this. Okay. Our, our thought processes. So here we have all those. We have our um, corticospinal pathway here and here. We have our lateral pathway here and our medial pathway here, here, and here. All right. So somatic motor pathway corticospinal is the big one. This is the one that begins in the primary motor cortex. Uh, wherever the neurons that control the body come out, they come down. They come down the tract into the midbrain. Now, uh, here, some leave. These are called cortical bulbar. 
corticobulbar come out. These are your, for your cranial nerves. These are for the cranial nerves is corticobulbar. They do that. The rest of these go down through the spinal cord and they come down into what is called the corticospinal tract where 85% goes corticospinal. So they travel down here, okay? So here's some cranial nerves, things like that, muscles, upper. We go down, we cross over at the pyramidal decansation or decansation of pyramids, and we travel down here out the lateral cortis corticospinal tract, okay? And this comes out. This is where 80%. Anterior corticospinal tract, that's about 15% that remained uncrossed, then crosses and exits. Okay. So upper motor neurons uh, are in red, lower motor neurons are in white. Okay. All right. That's your motor pathways there. Now let's talk about medial and lateral pathways. Medial pathway does gross movement of trunks and possible limb muscles, the big the big movements. Okay, they help control the lateral pathway as well. There's called the vestibulospinal tract, where cranial nerve number eight responds to auditory imbalance information. Uh, the receptors monitor position ahead, altering muscle tone for the body. Tectospinal does controls movement associated with superior and inferior colliculi, like vision and sound movements, like I see uh, something coming next to me in my peripheral vision, or I hear a loud noise next to me. Reticulospinal does control eye movement and breathing. Lateral spinal pathway controls muscle tone and precise muscle movements. The rubrospinal helps corticospinal tract when you have damaged corticospinal, and there's corticospinal. Spinal. All right. All right. So we're done, guys. That's it. And I'll see you guys. This is it. We're done. So I'll hopefully see you guys in AB2. So thank you guys for all your hard work this semester and good luck on your finals.